Thank you so much to the moderators and to the college for the invitation to speak today. I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, but I will disclose that I'm sitting here on a Saturday night right before this is due, recording this as I got called into an emergency case and uh, best laid plans of my cement off to go awry. Early stoma complications are common. No matter how much you plan, how hard you try, you're going to encounter these up to 50% of patients. I'm going to cover the most common early complications along with the treatment strategies, but keep in mind that outside of disease incidents, there's not a lot of randomized controlled trials on this topic. So my comments are going to be practical and based on experience. I'm not going to be able to discuss too many studies, which is sort of out of character for me. Now, very early complications usually require re-exploration, and there's not a whole lot of uncertainty about how to manage them. These can often be avoided using the advice from Dr. Bonner's talk. These are things like intra-abdominal hemorrhage from mesenteric convulsion, twisted conduits, maturing the wrong end of the stoma, which I've seen at multiple patients in multiple institutions, and then full thickness necrosis. Keep in mind with very early complications that these occur at the end of a long, difficult case. You're tired, you're hungry, you're ready to move on to the next task. Keep that in mind and be mindful and stay sharp. Don't leave the room and have the interim mature of the stoma. Don't rush the stoma. Check and double check your orientation and that'll help you avoid this. And remember the stoma is arguably the most important part of the case. Dysfunction can dominate a patient's recovery. Stomal ischemia occurs in up to 13% of patients. It's much more common after both emergency surgery as well as surgery in the morbidly obese. It occurs on a spectrum. It can be some dusky mucosa, partial thickness, and it can progress to full thickness. Now, where it lays on that spectrum is going to impact the timing and severity of the presentation. Whenever you have stoma ischemia, the most important part of your assessment is going to be finding out how deep it extends below the surface that you can see on the outside. The most common test employs what's called the test tube test over here on the left. You find a tube, usually on the wards, it's a blood draw tube. Insert it, lubricate it into the stoma and shine a flashlight. What you're trying to do is find out, is this stoma pink and viable at the level of the fascia? For me, I've had more success. I, I've used test tubes plenty of times, but I can get a rigid proctoscope to the bedside pretty easily at my institution. So I tend to use a pediatric proctoscope for the same task and visualize it directly. If you have a stoma that's viable at the level of the fascia, you need to be patient. If you go back in and try to remature a new stoma in this area, you're unlikely to have a better consequence in the long term. Instead, give it time, the necrotic tissue will slough, and you'll find yourself with a functional stoma long term. However, if you have necrosis below the fascia, it's a different situation. That usually requires exploration to resect the dead stuff and find something healthy to bring up to the abdominal wall. When you find yourself in the situation, ask yourself what went wrong. A lot of patients, if you bring the stoma out in the lower abdomen, especially through a lot of subcutaneous fat, that can be a big problem. So find out if it's going to help you to bring it out higher in the abdominal wall and make sure you have an adequate size of your aperture. Stomal stenosis, swelling and obstruction is also pretty common. Uh, clinically, this appears very similar to a postoperative ileus. If you get a CAT scan, you're going to find dilation of the bowel all the way up to the level of the fascia. Thankfully, a digital exam can solve your mystery pretty quickly between an ileus and an obstruction. Digital exams of the stoma are safe and useful for most stomas that haven't had output in the first three to four days. When you're digitizing a stoma, keep in mind, don't be afraid to remove the bag if you need that to get adequate access. Lubricate your finger well. You can use a smaller finger if necessary due to the size of the patient or size of the stoma. And be patient. Don't force your finger in there. You can tear things. The stoma is going to slowly dilate and allow you to get where you need to go. And make sure you digitize all the way to the level of the fascia. Plenty of people, especially trainees, will only go halfway through the sub Q and claim victory. But the problem you're looking for is at the level of the fascia. Now, if you can pass your finger through the fascia, then nothing further is needed. Uh, the patency is adequate. Sometimes just the digital stimulation alone will be enough to induce output. However, if you can't pass your finger, then you do have an obstruction. This is common, and thankfully, it's just due to swelling. Most of the time, it's going to improve with time. When you do have a stenosis, you need to bypass it somehow, and typically, you're going to use a tube to do this to stent the stoma open, allow the effluent to go through the tube, and then around the tube as well. This can also be useful if you want to irrigate large food boluses away from the area that could be obstructing. 
Now, just some tips and tricks for placing these catheters at the bedside. You need to use a soft catheter. I personally never use a red rubber. I think it's too firm. I use a Foley catheter, 16 or 18 French. Uh, bowel perforations have definitely occurred during aggressive placement. So you want to digitize first, and then the Foley is going to fall immediately after taking the same trajectory. I inflate my Foley balloon to 3 to 5 milliliters. That keeps the catheter in place. And then if it's pooped out, you know the stenosis has resolved. And if you're unsure of the anatomy or you don't have the skill set, don't hesitate to use fluoroscopy to do the same task or ask your interventional radiology colleagues for help. Now, this probably doesn't add much to the talk, but since I spent the time to make it in Microsoft uh, Paint, I thought I'd show you what it kind of looks like when you have a Foley catheter in the stoma. You just place it directly into the bag. You don't hook it up to a Foley uh, bag because it's going to leak around and cause quite the mess if you try to do that. Another important problem that comes up periodically is retraction uh, or mucocutaneous separation. It's common, but it's also thankfully very benign. First thing to keep in mind is don't try to remature these stones where they separate. That rarely improves the outcome, and you can actually trap bacteria and cause abscesses doing that. Instead, the first thing to do is get your stoma nurse involved so they can fill these defects in with paste and powder to reduce irritation. Over time, this is going to scar down, and the patient tend to do well. If you have circumferential retraction and separation, you are at a high risk of stomal stenosis in the long term, though. Skin excoriation is also pretty common. Um, usually, it's because stool gets in between the bag and the skin. Uh, if you find yourself with a low-profile stoma, it can happen. Also, if people are a little too aggressive with their brook bites, uh, you can get a fish to at the mucocutaneous junction. Often, if you get a convex wafer, that's going to help. A properly fitting appliance that doesn't have too much exposed skin helps. And then, if you're still not getting anywhere, make sure they don't have an allergy to the adhesive or a fungal infection. Now. I've sort of raced through some of the things I think a lot of people in the audience know how to do to go on to something that's a very important topic, which is the most common and probably most dangerous complication in the, in the short term, which is the high output ileostomy. The colon's main job is to absorb fluid and change liquid small bowel contents into solid stool. So if you remove it from the occasion with an ileostomy, most patients are going to have some degree of dehydration. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Readmission for dehydration occurs in 20-30% of patients uh, with ileostomies in the literature. That being said, keep in mind they're not always coming back to the home institution when they have dehydration. They're going to their local ERs. And so there are a couple of studies that look at statewide databases, and they've reported ER visits and or admissions in up to 50% of patients with ileostomies. So this is a big problem. When you're treating the high ileostomy output, the first thing you want to do, obviously, is correct the volume depletion of electrolyte abnormalities. And then you want to bulk up your output. Soluble fibers such as psyllium absorb fluid, create a gel-like consistency. Keep in mind that insoluble fibers like methylcellulose can often make the problem worse, and so details are very important. Lots of medications to throw at this problem as well. Probably the most common one is lepiramide or imodium. Uh, it loses efficacy after you get to a certain number of pills per day. Lamotil is also helpful, but has more side effects, and I have not found it to be synergistically effective when you combine the two. And then tincture of opium. Additionally, if you add a PPI, that can reduce your gastric secretions and reduce ileostomy output. Octreotide has been described, especially for jejunostomies, but it's rarely needed for an ileostomy. Now, uh, just to bring up kind of a topic that a little bit emotional, but I want to make sure everybody in the audience understands the physiology of cholestyramine. So bile acids are usually effectively absorbed by the TI. However, if you have somebody that's had their TI removed or they have a diseased TI, uh, these bile acids can pass into the colon, stimulate chloride and uh, fluid secretion by the colonocytes. That causes a pretty severe secretory diarrhea. So equestrian is a bile acid sequestrant, and it's very effective in treating this type of diarrhea. When you have a patient with high ileostomy output, remember, the colon and all of its channels is not involved in this process. And so cholestyramine has no impact on ileostomy output and should not be employed to try to slow down ileostomy output. Now, if you find yourself a still high output even after everything you've tried so far, the first thing you're going to ask yourself, does the patient still need this stoma? or can it be reversed? And if the answer is it cannot be reversed, give them tincture of time, all these problems are going to improve with time as the small bowel adjusts. Now, in conclusion, early stomal complications are common, but they thankfully rarely require surgical re-intervention. Temporizing measures are best as most issues improve with time. And then finally, no matter how much time is given to complete a talk, most speakers are going to hustle to get it done just prior to the due date, as I've demonstrated here today. Again, I really appreciate the invitation to talk, and feel free to reach out to me via social media or email if you have any questions. Thank you.